So now we'll um, start with this talk uh, by uh, Serge Robert and myself uh, about uh, Logic Muse project, uh, multidisciplinary initiative aiming to uh, developing a tutoring system for teaching reasoning, logical reasoning. So uh, the presentation will be done in two parts. First of all, Serge will uh, um, speak about uh, the logical foundation of this uh, work. And then uh, I will um, uh, speak in the second part about the tutoring systems and how we, we have implemented uh, implemented it um, uh, from uh, this collaboration with uh, several experts in uh, uh, reasoning psychology, uh, logician, and uh, many students who was involved in uh, in this uh, in this work. Yeah. So thank you, Raji. As Raji said, uh, I'll talk first. I'm the logician, as you know, and Raji is the expert in uh, intelligent tutoring systems. So up to now today, people have talked about the use of reasoning in the building of ITS. Now we will talk about a building a ITS for learning logic and for learning reasoning skills. The goals of Logic Muse. Logic Muse is an intelligent tutoring system for the teaching of logic that aims at combining logical, psychological, and computational expertises to build a unique tutorial for the teaching of logic, classical logic and non-classical logics. Okay, the, disciplin the disciplinary contributions to uh, Logic Muse, well, there is a psychological contribution to, uh, to start with what lay persons use as spontaneous reasoning procedures. The logic contribution is to treat expertise as formal structures not respected by lay persons. And the computer science component is to build an ITS based on the previous knowledge and to insist so on the metacognitive dimensions of learning. Okay, types of, and reason, of reasoning and rationalities. I won't repeat the lecture I gave last Tuesday, but I have to, to at least in a, as I would say in a synthetic, synthetic way, uh, come back to these things. I have distinguished in, the, in that lecture three kinds of rationalities that I think at work in human reasoning. The intuitive rationality, the one that is at work when we happen to make fallacies, the one of what I call human beings as storytellers, people who interact in everyday life. Okay, it is rational, that kind of rationality, because it is economical, fast, and often cognitively relevant. When an effect as only one cause, especially, or when categories are dichotomous, as I will explain a little further. The logical or a systematic rationality, the one logical reasoning, the one of logical reasoning, the one of human beings, not as storytellers in everyday life, but as proof tellers or justification tellers. Okay, it structures explicitly the information that we have. It allows also the discovery of possibilities of various causes in conditional reasoning, as I will explain, and of hierarchical categorization instead of dichotomous in disjunctive and incompatibility reasonings. I will explain this too. And there's a third kind of reasoning at work in human uh, reasoning that is the adaptive or suppressive rationality. The one of the cognitive corrections that we make in the suppression of valid inferences, the one of learning as an adaptation. The intuitive and the adaptive rationalities seem innate and spontaneous in human reasoning. But the, logic and one, the logical one is definitely recent in our history, as you know, since uh, I would say Aristotle. And this one is acquired, and it is not easy to acquire. So logic news, I think, is relevant. Okay. Uh, the first type of rationality, the one that we see in fallacies, and the third kind, the one that we see in suppressions of valid inferences. In a logically valid inference, one or, we have one or some premises that is the given information that we have. Then we apply a rule, be it explicit or simply implicit without knowing that we're applying a rule, and a conclusion that is the new information that is drawn from the premises and which is necessarily true if the premises are accepted as true 
and if the rule is logically valid. Okay. In the last decades, the psychology of reasoning, as we have seen the two first days, especially of our summer school, the psychology of reasoning has established that laypersons tend to make systematically two types of logical errors. First, fallacies, that is to draw a conclusion and an inference, considering that the conclusion is necessarily true while it is not. Usually it's only probable or possible. And suppressions of valid inferences to avoid to draw a logically valid conclusion. That is, people won't make the conclusion while it would be valid to do so. Okay. Some results in experimental psychologies, uh, psychology first concerning fallacies. Okay. Numerous studies in the psychology of reasoning since the Wazen's, the Wazen Cards experiment in the 1960s show that laypersons tend to make the following inferences and to consider them valid, be they valid or invalid, and so happen to commit fallacies. And I have explained last Tuesday fallacies that we make on conditionals. Uh, ponere means to assert, tolere means denial or negation. These words come from the Latin. Uh, I'm sorry, but it's usual in, in logic to use these terms. Uh, so, with conditionals, we have modus ponendo ponens, that is, you, we have a rule, if P then Q, and we assert ponendo P, and in the conclusion, we assert ponens Q. So, if it rains, I bring my umbrella, and it rains, so I bring my umbrella. It's valid, and we do that most of the time, I would say 25 times a day at least. Modus tolendo tollens, that is valid too. If P then Q, and Q doesn't occur, the consequent doesn't occur. So people conclude not P. We most of the time use it, not always, but most of the time, and it's valid. But unfortunately, most of us, we have a tendency to make these two. That is what we call the affirmation of the consequent, to assert that Q, and the denial of the ante antecedent, that is to say not P and the minor premise. And these two are not valid and we have a tendency to consider them as valid. For example, if, if it rains, I bring my umbrella. Serge has brought his umbrella, so it's raining. Well, it might be the case, but it might be the case that he brought the umbrella for another cause. So this one, if P then Q and, and Q then P is not valid, but people tend to do so and to make that inference. And the denial of the antecedent, if P then Q and not P, then not Q, for the same reason, it's not valid. But people tend to do that. Okay, with disjunctions, we have a disjunction, P or Q, and not P, Tolendo, then Q, ponens. Okay, P or Q and not P, then Q. It's valid and people use it most of the time. Same with Q, P or Q and not Q, then P. But we have also a tendency to use the two, the two last ones that are not valid. That is, if P or Q and P, ponendo, then not Q, tolerance. Well, if P, P or Q and P, then not Q is not valid because with a, with a disjunction, it would be possible that both P and Q would be true. So it's not valid and people use it. Other inferences with incompatibilities, and these ones are not in the literature as the ones on disjunctions and uh, conditionals. And these ones have been discovered by uh, myself and my assistant, Jenny Brisson, according to deductions that we made about things that I'll explain in a few minutes. And it was corroborated experimentally, our discovery. It is that people tend to make the same kind of fallacies with incompatibilities. So P is incompatible with Q, and P is the case, then not Q, because they're incompatible. And people tend to do that modus ponendo tollens valid inference. But a modus tollendo ponens inference is not valid, and people tend to do so. That is, P is incompatible with Q, P doesn't occur, so people have a tendency to say then Q occurs, but it's possible with an incompatibility that neither uh, the first nor the second happen. Okay. In our everyday reasoning, we happen to apply our beliefs, that is, if P then Q, or P or Q, or P incompatible with Q. These are families of, of uh, I would say, formal models of beliefs. We apply our beliefs to situations. For example, P is incompatible with Q is a belief, and not Q is a 
uh, an observation on the world. So we happen to apply our beliefs to situations and all 12 types of the previously described inferences, the four on incompatibilities, the four on conditionals, and the four on disjunction, we have a tendency at first land to consider them as valid. Okay, so we're not that logically competent, competent in everyday life. And a valid inference from the standpoint of logic is such that when the, premise, the premises are true, then the conclusion is necessarily true. In the previous fallacies, possibly true conclusions are considered by us as necessarily true, and that's the logical errors that we make. All the previous inferences on conditionals would be valid on biconditionals or equivalences. That is, the four on uh, conditionals would be valid with biconditionals. The four on disjunctions would be valid with, in, in, in a context of exclusive disjunctions in, instead of inclusive. And all the previous inferences on incompatibilities would be valid on exclusive disjunctions. So we have a natural tendency, as laypersons, I would say, to interpret conditionals as equivalences and disjunctions and incompatibilities as exclusive disjunctions. Why is it so? This is a Boolean lattice, and I explained that we follow the green arrows and we, we're in validly correct inferences. So for example, if I know that P and Q is true, then it implies that P is Q no matter the value of Q, which implies that P or Q is valid, which implies that a tautology between P and Q is valid, and so on. So all the inferences that follow green arrows from the left-hand side to the right-hand side are all valid, logically speaking. What happened with, with what I explained about the previous inferences is that we have a tendency to go in the, in the wrong direction in one way. That is, people tend to consider the inclusive disjunctions as exclusive, and compatibilities as exclusive disjunctions, and if then inferences as equivalences. So people have a tendency to go in the wrong direction in, in uh, one way. Why is it problematic? Why, why is it a problem? It is because here we have much information, we have much probability, here we have much information. And when we, do, we, do the we comment the fallacies, we put too much information in the premises. There is more information that we think present in the premises than the, the real information that is given in the premises. And to learn to uh, reason correctly from a logical standpoint is to learn to treat the content of the premises the way it is. Okay, I have explained that last Tuesday what is a Klein group, and it's a structure such that, that there are transformations that can be made within uh, uh, logic, and an identical transformation is to take, for example, if P then Q, and to keep it the, the same way, to stay at the same place. So A, B, C, and D are va variables for truth values. So, so the, if you add the truth, the truth values, for example, true for A, true for B, true for C, and false for D. True, 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 false. The identical gives true, 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 false. The inverse of true, 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 false would be false, 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 true. That is the negation of the previous values. And the reciprocal is the same values but in the, in the opposite order. So that the reciprocal of true, 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 false would be false, true, true, true. And the dual is the reciprocal of the inverse or the inverse of the reciprocal, that is not D, not C, not B, not A. I explain this because these four transformations form a Klein group. And in classical propositional logic, I don't have to explain these here because we don't have much time, there are two, what I call two genuine Klein groups. The one of disjunction, the disjunction, the incompatibility, P, the P and Q, and not P and not Q. And if you follow a diagonal, you have the inverse between two opposites. If you follow the horizontal line, you have the reciprocal opposition. And if you follow a vertical line, you have the dual opposition. And what happened in the fallacies? Well, as we'll see on the next slide, is that we have to make a horizontal crush of the Klein group. So making the fallacies that I talked about previously, we do this. 
and we do this, we consider this and this as equivalent, and this and this as equivalent. Okay, so let's see. All the fallacies that we have presented are a common structural feature from the perspective of the, of the Klein group. They all can be explained as not to take into account the duals of the connectives. That's why I call this a crush. That is, the dual not P and Q for if P then Q, and the dual P and not Q for if, if Q then P. Uh, that is, when we consider, we do so when we consider conditionals as equivalences. And the dual P and Q for P or Q, uh, when we consider inclusive disjunctions as exclusive disjunctions. And we can say the same for the incompatibility and in which we would take into account we would not take into account the dual. So we cross the Klein group when we make the fallacies. Okay, that's the important idea. Here are the two Klein groups. This is the Boolean lattice I explained before. And these are the two Klein groups, the, the one of the, uh, the conditionals and the larger one, the one of the junctions and then compatibilities. And what we do is that doing the fallacies on conditionals, we cross this Klein group this way and doing the fallacies on these two, Thank God I have long arms. <laughs> you make the same kind of crush with the other Klein group. Okay. Uh, now, Rubern in 1989 have made, has made an important discovery. That is not only we make fallacies, that is we consider a conclusion as logically valid while it is not, but also people tend to suppress, which, which is the opposite of the, the previous pheno phenomenon tend to suppress valid inferences on conditional in certain conditions. For example, she gave the example, if Mary has a textbook to read, she will study late in the library. She has a textbook to read, then she will study late in the library. And people succeed pretty well with that exercise. Then we have a participant. If the library is open, Mary will study late in the library. The library is open, and therefore was a conclusion. And people will all tell her, therefore she will study late in the library. Third ex exercise, we come back to the textbook exercise. If Mary has a textbook to read, she will study late in the library. She has a textbook to read, therefore, and people make the suppression of the valid inference because they will tell you, well, I don't know what happens with the schedule of the library, okay? So we call the, the, the schedule of the library a possible disabler of the inference. It's not valid from a logical standpoint, but from a cognitive standpoint, it is valid to, to do so, okay? So, People make suppression of valid inferences with, this, with uh, conditionals. I won't explain, but you can read, you, you could read uh, after the presentation on the PowerPoint. They do the same with the, with the disjunctions and incompatibilities. That is, people happen when they learn a new information after having done the inference the first time to suppress the inference, they, in a certain sense, they correct their inference and they do not um, uh, make the valid inference because they have learned something new. This is, this is a non-monotonic procedure, we will say. So in everyday reasoning, we happen to change our beliefs. And when we apply our beliefs in new situation, all the 12 types of inferences seen before seem invalid. So you see the, the idea. There are 12 types of inferences that I have studied. Six of them are valid from a logical standpoint. Six are invalid. What people do in everyday life, it's not that procedure. They consider all 12 as valid when they apply their beliefs, the beliefs that they, they have, when they apply them to, to certain situations. And when they, they get new information such that they change their belief, then none of the 12 inferences are done because people think that, well, with this new information, the, informa the in inference is no more valid. So what is to learn logic? It's, it's to learn that six are logically valid, six are logically non-valid, but it's not being a fool to, to, to make the 12 inferences when you apply your beliefs, and it's not being a fool to apply, not to apply the, the all 12 inferences when you change your beliefs. So the suppression of valid inferences goes as follows. Instead of going backwards in a Boolean lattice, you stretch the Boolean lattice. 
Instead of considering P or Q, you consider that you can have P or Q or R. R is the new information that you got. Instead of saying that if Q then P, you consider that if Q and R. And if the library is open, she will study late in the library. Same here. If, instead of considering if P then Q as if P then Q, you consider it as if P and R. And the library is open, then you will study later in the library. And here, instead of, in, of interpreting P is incompatible with Q as P is incompatible with Q, you interpret P is incompatible with Q as P incompatible with Q, or we have R. You see, R is the new information that we get. Okay, very good. Okay, and what happened to the suppression of inferences with the Klein groups? Well, you have a burst of the Klein group. So, in the suppression of valid inferences, each corner of the genuine Klein group is open with two possibilities, depending on the, the fact that the library is open or closed. Okay? So, so the basic idea. In everyday reasoning, when people have beliefs that are not changed and they apply them, they have a tendency to make fallacies that is to cross the Klein groups. And which means also to go in the wrong direction in the Boolean lattice. When they, they change their beliefs because they encounter new information, they have a tendency to make a burst of the Klein groups and to stretch the Boolean lattice, which are st strategies that are, that are not logically valid but cognitively coherent. Okay, our computational app approach can also be used for the analysis of fallacies and suppressions of valid inferences in logics other than the classical propositional logic. See, for example, the studies of Kristen Searitt with children that she presented last Friday. So, logic mules will in the future integrate the learning of non-classical logics like modal, probabilistic, fuzzy, and so on, relying on the same structural background. That is, uh, logical expertise is the application of a given formal structure of treatment of information. And in our everyday uh, cognition, because we use reasoning for cognition much more than to please the professor of logic, well, we make variations on those structures. Okay, learning logic as moving from the use of the layperson's spontaneous structures to the use of, of expert structures. Sorry. Okay, some pedagogical, pedagogical consequences of our work. I'm explaining now, as you can see, the formal background in order to model the, lay, the learner and the expert in our uh, tutorial system. So some pedagogical consequences of our work for the improvement of the teaching of logic and that will be incorporated in Logic Muse. First step. Well, it's important to explain to the student, to, to make the students aware of possible counterexamples to the conclusion, to their conclusions, in order to avoid the fallacies and make them aware of relying on just the, inf that, that is to avoid the fallacies, that is to think of possible counterexamples to the premises so that they won't make the fallacies. And to avoid them to make the, the, the suppression of inferences, it's to, is to, very important to make them understand that when you make logic, you have to rely on just the information given in the premises and not the information that you think through from your standpoint, or not to, be, to, to uh, uh, rely on new information that you have acquired changing your beliefs. A second step in the learning, it will be an awareness of the duals of the connectives, of the duals, that is, to avoid to crush the client groups. And the third step is to, probably in a more advanced course, to present to the students a formal study of the underlying structures of logical systems. For, for example, to introduce them to client groups and to the Boolean lattice, and to explain from a metacognitive standpoint that the learning that they made is to learn to use correctly these structures. Okay. The ingredients of our ITS. Well, of course, as in any ITS, we'll have, we have an expert model. 
in which we have the rules of the Klein group, that is the Klein group structure and the Boolean lattice structure and the consequences of these structures on the rules, that is all the rules that can be deduced from these structures and that are fundamentally the valid rules of classical propositional logic because up to now our, our ITS has worked on uh, classical propositional logic and we move to other logics afterwards. The learner model, that, that is a, a, a mo modeling of the status of a usual layperson, that is a person that has a tendency to crush Klein groups at times and in other situations when in the suppression of valid inferences to burst Klein groups. That is a, per a person that disrespects the one ways and the lattices and the Boolean lattice and the fallacies and that has a ten tendency to stretch the lattice in the suppression of valid inferences. And we have a tutor model that, is a, a, that contains a set of pedagogic, pedagogical strategies for transforming the learner into the expert, for tr transforming the, the one who makes the, the burst and the crushes and the client groups in a person who respects the structure of the client group. The diagnosis of the level of the competence of the learner is something important too. That is, up to which level the learner crushes the client groups or bursts the client groups. And for doing so, uh, uh, Roger will explain that we have developed a Bayesian network relative to the degree of difficulty of the problem submitted to the learner and to the degree of difficulty, of course, of the learner himself. Okay, I now leave the second part to my colleague. So, thank, thanks, Serge, and um, so, so thanks for this uh, good introduction to the system. And uh, as you can see, uh, the development of um, <coughs> music, uh, logic was based logic music. I mean, was based on um, strong knowledge from experts. You know, from Experts, especially logicians uh, like Serge, and also uh, uh, psychologists of reasoning was involved to help us, you know, um, the, um, elicitate the knowledge to be integrated or to be implemented in the systems. So um, the issue was to look at uh, the natures of the knowledge in, um, in place. Um, how this knowledge will be represented in the system and how can an individual system be helped to learn from those knowledge. Uh, and also what style of teaching interaction should we uh, set up and uh, how to manage uh, student error and provide him with uh, um, uh, helps. So that's why we, we think that uh, uh, developing an intelligent system was, was the solution for this. Uh, for this. I would not come back for, uh, about uh, uh, some motivation of uh, or challenge related to education. I think uh, some talk by Bev already uh, highlight this, uh, this, this part. So, um, okay, let's go now to the strategy we use to develop the, the system. Uh, of course, um, the, the goal, the main goal in terms of services w was to uh, develop a system which should be able to detect, diagnose and correct the learner reasoning errors in multiple problem solving contexts. So we are not only uh, interesting to help a student in um, abstract logic or something, but we want to help him in problem solving situation uh, where we have, uh, for example, uh, a description of the situation in a narrative way. And also we, we, we like to um, provide a metacognitive support to learners, you know, by using, for example, the meta structures or meta logic structures, such as Boolean lattice, so that this, the learner will be able to visualize how uh, reasoning come out from that, uh, those structures and be more aware about uh, uh, the, the, the reasoning procedure. And um, yes, so the architecture of logic uh, muse is uh, quite simple. It's based on classical uh, ITS uh, architecture as we saw this morning. 
so we have uh, the three main components plus the learning environment. Um, so if we'll go through, of course, detail of the details of this, uh, each of these components, the SPS models and um, the student model, but I will maybe um, have a um, detailed look about the learner model because uh, we, we, we are carrying out an evaluation of the solution we have developed so far. So, but first of all, we can see that the SPM model um, not only represents uh, correct reasoning knowledge, reasoning inference rules, but also uh, we have uh, some uh, incorrect rules and uh, even uh, what we call an error catalogs. Uh, but we also develop uh, a semantic memory uh, in terms of uh, logic uh, ontology, demand ontology, logic ontology, uh, where some concept, basic concepts, uh, concepts of logic are uh, described and uh, used to connect it uh, in, in, in some um, resonance situation. Uh, so I will come back on this uh, later. So let's have a quick look on the DSSP model. Um, of course, we have um, the representation of some problem space connected to a uh, problem solving situation where reasoning uh, is, is, is necessary. And also, um, the skill models is defined to clarify what skills is needed, you know, to be able to uh, be a, a good reasoner. And um, all knowledge beyond the reasoning are, is, uh, are elicited uh, through um, what we call uh, the, 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 the knowledge model, knowledge model, where we have uh, uh, inference rules. Inference rules models depend on the logic. If we are in the classical logic, for example, uh, we are speaking about this inference rule that uh, Serge just uh, presented to you. But uh, in another logic, it will be another rules, of course. And uh, the semantic mo uh, model is the ontology. Uh, we also represent the meta structures, log logic structures, you know, client group and Boolean lattice as structures that support all this knowledge. Uh, so we, we go through uh, engineer, knowledge engineering task, you know, to be able to, uh, to put, uh, putting down all these pieces of knowledge that are needed to, to build the system. Um, and uh, as you can see also, we quietly separate uh, correct knowledge from what we can see, call uh, uh, buggy knowledge, like fallacies and uh, uh, suppression of valid inference, as you can, as uh, Seth just uh, presents. So, all this uh, uh, piece of knowledge was filled with knowledge coming from the experts, and uh, uh, we have a great knowledge base of uh, classical logic, which uh, is in place now in the system. So, um, so the goal was to, uh, to identify situations in which learners apply some reasoning process to solve problems and explicitly represent knowledge beyond those reasoning process. So, uh, what and how, so we, as I already speak, <laughs> I speak about all that, we have developed the ontology and then procedural knowledge related to the reasoning, et cetera, et cetera. So it's okay. Um, so this is an example. For example, the MTT, uh, to learn to, to lens, modis to learn to, to lens, which is uh, formally stated in this way, were, was clearly you know, represented in the system using uh, uh, rule language. Uh, we use uh, the Java SP system rule for that. And so, um, with this representation, we are able, of course, to uh, track uh, these inference rules from uh, student reasoning. Uh, uh, I mean, reasoning produced by a, by, by a given student. So we create uh, rule-based systems who uh, implement all those inference rules. Um, um, in terms of uh, knowledge type, knowledge uh, typolo uh, to, to typology, yeah. So we, uh, we also uh, use something that was provided by uh, the, one of uh, the members of our team, uh, 
psychologists of reasoning who uh, said that, in fact, knowledge uh, about reasoning are situated in different contexts. So there uh, is five, I mean, six classes of, of um, or category of uh, uh, reasoning where uh, I'm naming the causal, uh, for example, the, the concrete, I mean, causal reasoning can be um, uh, run in concrete situation, in abstract situation, or even in contra contrary to fact situation. So there is, we, we have identified all these categories, which uh, in fact serve us to, um, I mean, to go through a more specific skill elicitation because uh, being, being able to, for example, to make, uh, uh, to, to success on a MPP in concrete causal situation uh, not means that, does not mean that you will be able to do it in the con contrary to fact situation, for example, where you have a few alternatives or many alternatives. So we try to... Let me five seconds. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Easy. A little less easy, a little harder, a little harder, and means more difficult. Yeah. For human beings. In <laughs> so. Yeah. So meaning that skills are, you know, we, sh we should, you know, focus on specific skills in uh, uh, each uh, category because it's uh, quite different and the degree of difficulty is vary depending to the to that uh, those context. So um, for the tutor. Okay, we, uh, we, we have a great design of what we want to do, but even if uh, all these are not already in place, so when a tutor will be able to have uh, some strategies, metacognitive meta strategies, you know, to make so that correcting learners er er error will be do, uh, done in, um, um, in, so that a student can reflect on his own, you know, production, on his own er er errors, so we should uh, implement some metacognitive rules to support this kind of interaction when uh, uh, some errors are uh, arised during reasoning. But we also want to um, explore many um, form of tutoring service to provide to the learners. For example, uh, if uh, the learner need, need, mostly need a companion, someone will be uh, with him or her you know, during the learning, yeah, we'll go to with a companion or a coaching system or I don't know. So, or, or maybe a co-learner, you know. Co-learner means meaning that uh, we'll try to set the system so that uh, the virtual tutor will be a co-learner co with, uh, will be also a learner, learning together with the learn, uh, learner, the, current, the human learner. Um, yes. Uh, so, Logic Muse provides a key uh, tutoring system. For example, uh, it's possible to the learner to explore the domain uh, ontology, just you know, to be aware about some basic concept in logic. Uh, there is also, uh, we provi also provide a space where the learner can you know, exercise himself on some uh, logic concepts. For example, trying to um, uh, make some uh, f logic formula conversion, uh, building to a table, uh, connecting to a given situation, and so on. Uh, of course, the, the main service here is the reasoning procedure learning service, where the student will be provide some problem solving uh, situation um, uh, that involve reasoning procedures, and you will try to do it with the help of the systems, and also. Uh, we have a space where students can be aware about some metacognitive We will see all that in the implementation in next to my talk. So, but before that, I would like to give more information about the, the student model. So, we call it a multi-dimensional perspective of the learning model because, uh, as you can see, this uh, not only the cognitive model of the, the learner is, uh, is, is, is represented here, but also affective, even what we call psychometric model, but yeah, I'll speak about that, but also episodic model with, you know, everything that students is doing during the learning session are uh, stored in terms of data, and maybe uh, some data mining uh, techniques can, you know, uh, 
come out with uh, interesting uh, information from, from those data. Um, yes, so now I will, of course, give more uh, information about that. So the goal was to create and update the student model based on her, uh, his interaction with the system. And the STS may assume that the student know nothing or has some standard prior knowledge. Uh, we'll see how we can estimate those, uh, that standard prior knowledge. Uh, the student prior knowledge may be evaluated by using a pretest, exhaustive pretext or adaptive pretest. And the system may use patterns among students. In, uh, uh, for example, if you have data uh, from the student group, from other students, then we can maybe uh, use some techniques to you know, come up with um, uh, uh, initial state of, of the learner. So in terms of cognitive model, we should represent learner knowledge and learner skill. Uh, we have used uh, a Bayesian network to, for, for that. Christina is uh, an expert for this kind of, uh, I mean, this choice is motivated uh, by the fact that we should uh, keep in mind that um, um, an ITS uh, only have uh, uh, an approximation of you know, what the student know, really. So using a st system like a Bayesian network, probability signal uh, uh, system is maybe the, the, the best thing to do. Uh, in, that, uh, in that situation. So the Bayesian network is itself um, yeah, is just uh, important, uh, quite adequate uh, formalism for this tax because you know, uh, this uncertainty should be uh, taken into account when we infer knowledge about uh, a given learner. Um, so for our Bayesian, Bayesian network in logic maze, we use, uh, you can, this, this um, classes of uh, skills was uh, the basic, uh, I mean, basic uh, structures we used, you know, to, uh, to, to put inside every skills related to the reasoning. So we have six reasoning situation, okay, in which we, uh, we uh, in, in which each of them uh, have uh, three reasoning modes their situation and uh, for reasoning type. The reasoning type here is related to the conditional uh, logic, uh, I mean operators, meaning the and, the or, the implication, and the com uh, compatibility operators. Janice uh, <laughs> was uh, the expert on that, uh, on that part. So we have uh, um, a, a number of skills that we can represent uh, through uh, the network. But um, we have some insight from uh, psychology of reasoning telling us that uh, sometimes being competent in conditional log logic also means that we'll, uh, the decision should be, I mean, the, the person should be able to manage some uh, particular skills, naming the inhibition of P and not Q the generation of not P and Q, and the three mental models management. I mean, so this is a, a higher level skills that are also needed, you know, to be, uh, uh, to evaluate, to clearly evaluate a student in conditional logic uh, reasoning. So uh, these three abilities or skills are directly connected, you know, to the basic one, like MPP, uh, MTT, and so on. So from all this, we have was able to build this uh, basic network where in the, okay, we have um, two levels in this Bayesian network. The first level was, uh, is the, the performance level where, where you have, uh, you know, uh, items related to, to uh, you know, lo logic yeah, reasoning exercises. And, uh, but the very first level, I mean, after the performance level, uh, the first level is uh, concerned, you know, the skills we have in each category. And as you can see here, the three uh, upper level uh, skills are directly connected to those three skills. And what you see here is the fourth of the six categories we have uh, just presented to you, uh, who are very involved in what we call the conditional uh, reasoning competency or skills. So this is the, uh, the, 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 the roof of that, and meaning that uh, someone who has this competence should be able to, uh, to, to reason very well in condition, uh, using conditional logic. Um, 
So this is the basic network uh, with, of course, the, the uh, all, as always, the, the, the difficult part was to be able to put information about on, on this first building uh, the, 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 the business network itself because we should, you know, uh, uh, we, we should identify the causal relationship between, between nodes and this was done uh, with, with the experts uh, and was validated in some what. Uh, also, um, uh, the probabilities, that uh, conditional probabilities that are needed, you know, to make this system uh, run uh, correctly. And uh, for that, uh, from now we have we we we, um, we based this information about what we get from the experts, but we are now carrying carrying out some uh, experiment uh, with data to be able to validate you know this, uh, this this probability and even validate the structures of the Bayesian network. I will say some words about that uh, in the next. Slides. So, um, so how d d does this work? Uh, as in the performance level, we have uh, items. So, uh, I mean, the, the, the cognitive models of the student will be represented with this network, initialized uh, maybe f from a pretext, pretext to g to get uh, the the I mean the estimate uh, level of the, the, the student. And uh, when the student will go through uh, problem solving in, in reasoning, uh, then you know, we have some evidence uh, about this performance. We'll make, uh, try to maintain this, uh, <coughs> this network you know, uh, so that at any time of the system we have, uh, at a given time of the system we have, uh, we, we can estimate you know, uh, the, the student knowledge at that time. So, the psychometric part of the, of the approach uh, is quite interesting because we can benefit you know, from data collected from, from the peers, I mean, for other learners, you know, to be able to train a model that can predict you know, the skills of a new student. So what we did is to uh, run a classic uh, cognitive data model, uh, analysis model, I mean, which means, means that building a Q matrix and uh, having some data ab of, uh, about uh, learners' performance and uh, uh, estimating uh, some parameters important for this kind of model, I mean the grace and sleep parameters, and also choose which kind of uh, model we want to uh, run. I mean, if uh, you choose to run a DINA or DINA model, then that means that um, uh, as uh, all, all skills that are related to a given item should be mastered before, uh, to, uh, before that, I, I mean, before that uh, uh, skills, uh, that item be uh, successed by a given student. Um, and then this will, model will help us to make some uh, prediction. This is the Q matrix that we have built with Jani. Jani? <laughs> Jani? <laughs> And uh, as you can see, we have, uh, I mean, it's a simple matrix where you have uh, skills, you know, in the, in the, in the column. And uh, each row uh, is related to each item. And when you see one, it's because uh, uh, one means that uh, the, the skill is necessary for that item. And zero is, is uh, yeah, it's not necessary. So we have uh, a grid Q matrix. Uh, of course, this kind of structure should be, uh, need to be validated, validated, I mean, with the experts to be sure that, uh, you know, what we have put inside is okay, okay. but uh, I think Jani uh, did that. And uh, we run the model and uh, we have, uh, I mean, CDM is a very simple model. You can find an implementation of these uh, techniques in uh, R library. I mean, there is uh, um, R, um, uh, API uh, implemented for CD, to support CDM. So if you have uh, a key matrix and you have uh, some details about, uh, for example, the student, then you can run this model to, uh, I mean, come up with many, many information that is very interesting. For example, you can have uh, information about each question. Uh, this is the, the guess probability and sleep probability related to each item, you know. So the, the probability of guessing and uh, yeah. 
And you also have the IGI, this is a very interesting one because uh, it provides information about how well the, the item is important. Uh, it's interesting in, in, that, uh, in that model, so uh, yes. And also you have what we call a marginal skills probability for each skills in the, in the systems, uh, which is computed automatically by the, by the model. Uh, and also maybe the one of the, okay, what we see, you see here is uh, a profile. The profile is a vector of skills, you know, of all skills, you know, just have information like one zero, meaning that they still have the skill or not. And uh, so this is, uh, for example, a probability that a student have this, has, I mean, this uh, skills. But maybe the most important structures here uh, in that uh, kind of techniques is, is what we call the posterior uh, uh, probabilities, which is compute, uh, <clears throat> uh, giving information about, uh, you know, for, for each pattern of answer, because we suppose that you have, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 10 items. So for each pattern of answer on these 10 items, you have the probability of, uh, of the profile. I mean, for example, here, it means that uh, there is no chance, I mean, little chance that uh, a, a student will have, will have gave this answer to the items being in this pro profile, meaning that zero, 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 meaning that you have uh, no, no, uh, no knowledge about uh, the first skill, the second skill, and the third skill. So this is very interesting, and we use this uh, to compute, because one of the issues in student modeling is to be able to compute the initial uh, value of, this, uh, of the student states. So this can help, for example, if the student go through a pretext with those items, then we, 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 we will be able maybe to, uh, to, to compute uh, the, the, a probability, uh, the, uh, the initial probability of the student. We can be, uh, instead of uh, uh, saying that uh, there is 50% of chance to, uh, to, to, be, uh, to have these skills or, and 50% of chance to don't have it, we'll maybe put the good probability there and that will be more accurate, you know, for the, okay. So um, let's show you, uh, let me show you some uh, screen shot of the implementation of MUSE. Uh, there is two, we provide two learning, uh, uh, learning uh, uh, modes. So a mode where the learner have the control to select uh, his own activities and the mode where the tutor can control and you know, provide some exercises to the learner depending to his uh, level of, uh, of, of skills. And uh, you know, uh, this is an example of uh, problem solving situation. You have the problem statement, rules, and the information is classic syllogism. And the uh, student give answer, provide an answer, and the, the, the tutor provide feedback. Maybe sometimes prompt student with more questions you know, to, to, uh, to be sure uh, what is going out. And uh, you know, uh, you have uh, here, for example, uh, it was uh, some kind of um, fallacy, uh, uh, AC fallacy, that was detected by the system, and the system can provide you know, more information to the student. For example, asking him to, or her to, uh, to think about more alternatives, for example, you know. <coughs> Uh, yeah, you, there is possible to uh, also to uh, uh, help students to be uh, able to, you know, to build some, uh, 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 to formalize some situations, problem solving situations in terms of logic, uh, logical problems. And uh, yeah, the Bayesian network, yeah, I speak about the metacognitive sp uh, space where the student can, you know, it's some kind of open learner modeling model where student can visualize his own progress, uh, pro progress, you know, in, for example, in the Bayesian network and so on. And um, can took other forms, for example, uh, how well he performed, he has performed on every kind of, uh, any kind of uh, skills, for example, MPP, uh, and we can have a different view of this, you know, and uh, yeah. So um, normally, uh, in the next uh, version of Muse, this uh, interface has to be—I uh, mean, this, the, 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 
students should be able you know, to interact with the system to have more inf information or more explanation about this, uh, this feedback. Okay, and uh, also uh, meta, uh, meta logic structures are used sometimes to, you know, to aware the student about what, what is going on when, when there is uh, an error and so on. So we can visualize, for example, the Boolean lattice and the, uh, yes? This is the Boolean lattice, but with a counterclockwise rotation of 90 degrees. Okay, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so we can, you know, just uh, try to um, represent in this uh, what is uh, the problem and uh, why. So this give, provide the, the, the learner with more explanation uh, of that. So in terms of evaluation, we, uh, we carried out a small evaluation. For the experts model is quite easy because the only thing was to try to see if the experts can, can provide good answer you know, to uh, exercise uh, to g the given uh, exercises. That was quite uh, interesting without surprising because, uh, you know, it's a classical SPS system, so it's nice. Uh, as, as long as the, the, the rules are clear, everything's are clear, so no problem with that. Now, uh, for the Bayesian network, so, uh, yeah, yeah, how can we validate, you know, a structure like that, you know? Uh, so, I, the validity of a Bayesian network, a student network, uh, lays mainly on the capabilities of this inference mechanism to accurately infer the learning skills from the input data previously collected. So, we, uh, this, I mean, we have access the predictive ability of the Bayesian network in logic means, means using uh, what we call an incremental cross validation uh, in three steps. So uh, the training data increase one by one, and the test data decrease one by one, okay? And the prediction was done on one student at a time by entering uh, as evidence to the network the response of a particular student and try to infer the other's uh, answer for, this, for that student. So for each of the 71 students, we uh, were answered to 49 logic problems we have uh, compared the real answer of each question with the one predicted by the network. So this question was provided to us by Jani. Uh, Jani? I have to switch you know, for French. <laughs> okay, so we use some parameters to, uh, to, to, to make this evaluation classic, pre uh, pre precision, records and, records and accuracy. And what we get is quite interesting. For example, if we compare here, yeah, the, the trend of the real data from one student. What you have here is the answer of a student on the, 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 the 49 questions. So we can see that the prediction, the trend of the prediction is quite similar, you know, to what we get from race data. You can all, uh, see that in another perspective here. But maybe the most important thing is that uh, after 10, 50 questions, okay, the prediction the accuracy become very, very interesting. We are speaking about uh, 80% uh, accuracy, in terms of accuracy. So, results show, show that, uh, shows, results show that uh, after an average of 10 to 15 questions answered, the Bayesian network is able to predict the behavior of a learner with accuracy of 80%. Some prediction errors can be due to the guess, guess and, or, and sleep parameters of the question, you know. And uh, yeah, so some challenging issue, issue remain. We can, of course, improve that network. Maybe try to see how we can learn, I mean, val validate these uh, structures uh, by using, for example, the CDM. Because the CDM, one of uh, interesting after, uh, output of the CDM, is a, a matrix uh, of skills, you know, uh, uh, inform about, I mean, the, the correlation between skills. Maybe if we train uh, uh, this on, uh, uh, we train the model from real data, we can come up with, you know, very, very uh, precious information about how these skills are really related given the, uh, the data. 
and this can you know provide some information to modify to extend maybe the structures of the business network um, yeah in summary I will say that uh, what we uh, have done is to try to uh, develop a system uh, internet training system by providing an explicit fine grain domain model you know, uh, domain uh, ontology, procedural memory, developed from uh, collaboration with HPS. Uh, we also um, um, contribute with a multidimensional learning model where the current focus is, of course, about the cognitive and psychometric part of the model. We are, there is no, no affective uh, information here in, uh, in this version of the system, but we are, of course, uh, planning to uh, to take into account this, uh, the affects, the learner affect during this resonant situations, um, and also we have uh, an include implicit encoding of tutoring strategies. You know, but uh, of course, this tutoring strategies is not based uh, on real pedagogical theories until now, but uh, <laughs> from um, uh, the, uh, the experience of 30 years teaching of logic. Uh, reasoning by, by search. So from that we were able to try to come up with some rules that can guide the student during uh, reasoning learning. So um, what's next? So maybe we should continue on with a deep statistical uh, analysis of, uh, data, uh, of the results of we, we received with uh, this experiment. Uh, for example, you know, the question was um, provide in a, a certain order. Maybe if we, 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 we do it uh, randomly if the result may change. Um, the prior probability in the network will be refined according to the results of SEN. And uh, also, we are planning to uh, conduct a sum summative evaluation, uh, you know, uh, deploying uh, logic muse in the real setting, uh, setting by uh, search. I mean, we are planning to do that maybe this autumn, or I don't know, <laughs> it will depend. Um, and also testing the openness, uh, openness of the logic mirror systems. I mean, uh, the capability to extend, easily extend the system with new contents. For example, focus on another type of reasoning logic, uh, non-plastic logic, I don't know. And, uh, but uh, what I can say is that we, the way that we have designed this system will be quite, uh, I mean, this extension will be quite uh, simple to be realized because we have to take some engineering decision that normally should ease this process. So thank you very much. And thanks to the team. You know, it's, this work is, uh, of course, uh, work from several person, uh, many students was involved in that. And uh, thanks to you all.